I will bow out then and Sheridan, I will let you take it from here. And Melanie, um, oh, you already started recording? Great. Is chat enabled? Yes, it should be. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we'll, um, we save time at the end for Q&A and chat. Um, and then Sheridan, you know, you know the drill, let everyone know to use that Q&A feature if they have any questions and we'll answer them um, as we go. Sounds good. Awesome. Just let me know when I'm good to start. You're good. Okay, let's do this. Um, welcome to the third of many conversations titled A Seat at the Table with Play Versus Game Changers. My name is Sheridan. I will be your host today. Um, a little bit about me. I'm the social media manager for Florida State Esports, graduating this December. I have completed a few projects celebrating women in gaming, and I am absolutely honored to be part of this Game Changer initiative with Play Versus. Um, everyone in the audience, be sure to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen to uh, get all your questions in. And we'll be doing question and answers at the end. Um, and let's introduce our panelists. Um, we're, today we're going to be taking a look inside esports adjacent industries from a few different angles today. Our first panelist is Wendy from HyperX. Wendy Lacotte grew up playing arcade games in a mall, progressed to a World of Warcraft parent, and today is an avid fan of the NBA 2K League. For two decades prior to joining HyperX, Wendy compiled success after success in various business manager, product man ma management, channel sales, and marketing positions at Kingston, IBM, Ingram Micro, and Epson. A graduate of Pepperdine University, Lacotte holds a master's in business administration. Our second panelist is Dr. Melita Moore from Level Up Sports Medicine. Melita N. Moore, MD, is a quadruple board certified sports medicine physician. She is a team doctor for the NBA 2K, WNBA, and NBA leagues. In addition, Dr. Moore is a board member of the Global Esports Federation, where she uses her platform to promote healthy gaming and elevate women and persons of color in gaming. And our final panelist today is Ashley Hodge. She is the esports co coach at, at Dodge County High School. Coach Ashley Hodge is a member of Riot Scholastic Association of America Board of Advisors. She also built one of the largest esports programs in Georgia and has been a coach since season zero. Currently, she is working on a doctorate dissertation focused on esports programs in high schools and the male and female student experiences in these programs. This dissertation will be the first of its kind. Very cool. Um, so we're just gonna we're just gonna jump right into the questions. Um, we can start with uh, Coach Ashley. How did you get your start in your career? Um, well, first of all, can you hear me okay? Fantastic. Um, I've been a gamer since the 90s. Uh, we, we probably all have that <laughs> in common. Um, so I just, I really loved video games. I became an English teacher. Uh, three years into my teaching career, our assistant, um, not assistant, but athletic director said, hey, esports is coming to high school. Do we have any volunteers? And of course, I was first in line <laughs> to volunteer. Um, I was interviewed by the Board of Education. I was hired and uh, became an esports coach. And since then I've been interviewed uh, by multiple people. I became a member of Riot's RSAA, as you stated, and as they say, the rest is history. That's awesome. Dr. Moore, would you like to tell us how you got started in your career? Sure. Um, in my medical career, uh, I've always wanted to be a doctor. It's the only thing I've ever wanted to do. I was very blessed to know that from a very young age in elementary school. Uh, I love playing sports. I grew up as a three sport athlete in high school. I played volleyball in college on scholarship. And I've always wanted to pair medicine and sports. 
I had no idea how I was going to do it. I just knew I wanted to be a doctor to take care of athletes. And so I laid out a foundation uh, very early on that that was my goal. I had a very supportive family and still do um, that still helps to encourage me and, and has helped me along the way. And so that has got me to where I am now. So I'm the first black female physician uh, in the NBA. And so that was a big, big honor for me. And that was almost a decade ago now. And so um, I'm just really enjoying my journey in medicine. And then I didn't choose esports. Esports chose me. But I'm sure we'll talk about that a little later. That is fantastic. And congrats. Thank you. Wendy, would you like to tell us about how you got started in your career? Sure. Um, well, I was pretty independent at an early age. I grew up in a tiny town in New England, and I wasn't staying there. I at least knew that. So, um, so I, you know, I imagined, you know, traveling the world and, um, you know, uh, speaking many, many languages. So that was a vision of where I thought I was going to head. But um, Along the way, um, I did go and get educated in Mexico City, then I came to LA um, and finished my education here and moved on to, to get an MBA. And you know, when you're living on your own, I kind of had to bootstrap my education together, but certainly in life, I mean, I needed to, to um, you know, have security and benefits and things like that. So you know, in the 80s, because that's when I came to LA, um, that, you know, a tech, career was where it was at. Um, it was very open, very in, encouraging to women at the time. So that's a direction that I took and, um, you know, started working in the telecommunications um, industry uh, and doors just really opened up for me and I really enjoyed it. There was a technical aspect to it. So that really was not gaming at that time, uh, that's for sure. And then I um, eventually moved from those tech positions, um, landed at Kingston, uh, they formed a gaming division uh, and all of my marketing experience um, really paid off. I was able to um, you know, really support the HyperX brand, was brought over to the HyperX team and I loved uh, kind of the entrepreneurial nature of the industry uh, and seeing it grow. So that's how I got here. Awesome. And so I would like to ask all of you for your advice. How can students prepare themselves for entering the industry, either high school students or even college students? Um, Ashley, if you want to start us off. Yeah, um, sure. Um, now, by industry, you, you mean esports industry, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah was, of course. I was about to go into a well to be a high school teacher. This is what <laughs> <laughs> um, well, from my perspective, I mean, being a high school teacher is how I kind of got involved with esports. So it kind of goes hand in hand for me. Um, I, I now teach audio and film. So that is also another way to get into this industry. You know, you don't have to be a professional player just to be in the esports industry because God knows I'm not a professional <laughs> player. Um, but, you know, you could cast, you could film, you could broadcast, you could be a crew hand. And um, I mean, really starting with an audio and film career could be an easy access point, you know, for the non-gamer um, people looking forward to joining this industry. Definitely. And Dr. Moore, do you have any anything to add here? I know you're more of a esports adjacent career, but if you have any advice for students in general, that would be awesome as well. No, absolutely. As a, when you choose a profession like medicine, you're a lifelong learner, number one, be prepared to be in school for a very long time um, and to train for a very long time. But this is what I love to do. Being a team physician is actually what gets me out of bed every morning. And so if I could have, tell, have had someone tell me when I was in high school, what I could do to better my chances of getting into, you know, the top school, the school you wanted to get into for medical school, study hard, do community service, and not because it's required, but because you want to. Um, and I, it, I think it's really important to make sure that you attach yourself to people who are like-minded, like you, who have goals in mind like you. They don't have to be the same goals, but they're goal-oriented. Right now, it's easy to kind of get lost in all of the social media fake life that goes on. Be true to yourself, stay grounded, and find your circle. I have um, girlfriends that have been my best friends since my freshman year of high school. 
And so I think that has helped me get to where I am in my career. It's not specific for medicine, but it's certainly specific to be, I think, successful in whatever career that you choose. Um, and specifically to medicine, you have to study, study, and study. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely important for students as well. You gotta, always got to study. Wendy, would you like to add anything? Sure. So, um, yeah, I think you need to find out um, – as, as much as you may share the love of gaming, um, but you need to find out um, kind of at your core um, skill, what, are you, what else are you passionate about? What do people observe about you that you're skillful at? What do you naturally tend to kind of be good at? Are you a storyteller? Are you a writer? Are you a debater? Are you a community builder? Um, do you excel at math? Are you an entertainer? Um, if you look at some of those, you know, just kind of core attributes of you as a person, where do you shine best? And then from there, find out where some of those leadership roles are um, within either high school. I mean, I, certainly start at high school if you have access to teams and uh, a formal club environment. Um, you know, the, the times are so rich um, with really kind of formal groups um, that you can lean in on. And um, what I think is really, really important um, is getting some form of experience. Um, and you can start to build your resume, you know, immediately in high school. And it's through those leadership roles and clubs and things like that. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, don't rule out, um, big one for me is those transferable skills. Um, you know, there are lawyers at Riot Games. Um, you know, we have lawyers in our environment, we have, you know, accounting folks and stuff. So, you know, just because you may have a trend, if you pursue a transferable skill, you can still enjoy the world of gaming because you work for a gaming company. You don't always have to be a game developer. Definitely. And I think before we ask any more of the questions I have on my list here, it would actually be really interesting to hear from each of you, like what your day to day looks like, because I'm sure it's different for all three of you. Um, so whoever wants to start us off, uh, Wendy, if, if you want to start yeah. out, us off, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So I'm um, very, you know, we're a gaming peripherals company. So we make uh, hardware that helps you with your game. Um, and so I'm very, I'm not involved in the launching of products and things like that. So I'm very externally focused. So I am understanding, you know, who could be our partners in, um, in the industry as well as outside of the industry. So I talk to game developers, or I may have a conversation with McDonald's or Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble, um, because they're all looking at gamers as an audience that they would like to speak to. Uh, and so um, there's good synergy there with us as a brand. Um, so uh, I guess for me, the day is very much about um, building relationships um, external communications um, to people in the industry. So I have to keep a really, I have a bunch of feeds that come into me to understand what moves are happening in the esports industry. You know, what investments are taking, you know, taking place where? So I look at, you know, net new people coming on in uh, and movement within in the industry. So it's very externally focused. Awesome. And Dr. Moore, if you want to talk about what is what is working with a team look like for yeah so my my days are interesting um pre-covid certainly are different than you know now during covid but i was just in the WNBA bubble for this for six weeks wow. uh and so i was very um lucky to be selected as the only team physician to go to the WNBA bubble to take care of all teams all athletes and so that was 24 hours a day seven days a week inside of uh quarantine environment with 350 plus people that were technically under my medical care, but certainly focused on the athletes. Um, Pre-COVID, I take care of our NBA 2K team uh, who did win the championship. Uh, so I'm very, very, I know, go district, uh, <laughs> Wizards District Gaming that happened while I was in the bubble. Um, I'm also the team doctor for our WNBA Washington Mystics who won the championship mm -hmm. last season. So as I am in the bubble, watching our Mystics play, I am on my phone watching WizDG win this championship. And for me to have that crossover of both championship teams at that time, was just a, a moment I don't think I'll ever 
be able to experience again in that way. Um, so if we were in regular times pre-COVID during the season, my day starts very early. Physicians, medicine starts early. Uh, you know, we usually have meetings starting at seven. My first patient's at eight, but um, I also have a, a brand management company through eSports, which we'll, we'll talk about. So I usually get up around three to 5 a.m. I work on eSports related stuff, um, get ready and get on an hour and a half commute to work. I see patients all day, just regular people, you know, coming in with any aches and pains for muscles and bones. And then I'll usually, we'll drive in another hour and a half to get to the arena for a game or a practice or to go see an athlete. Um, and then my day usually ends, I get home usually around nine, nine o'clock at night. So um, I used to exercise in the morning and I'm playing esports, so I just need to kind of get back to that. But uh, I wouldn't trade these kind of days for, for anything. Wow. That is, that is awesome, and I, I hope you get a lot of sleep because those hours I sound you. <laughs> <laughs> important. And Ashley, if you want to talk about your day-to-day -day as, a, as a coach. Yeah, um, so I sign in at 7.45. Um, I'm usually at school by 7, uh, doing pre-teaching pre things. Uh, I teach three film classes, film one, film two, film three. Um, I do that throughout the day. Uh, no day is ever the same because students are always coming with different, um, you know, fun things to talk about or film, film things that they want to talk about film wise. Um, but my esports day really starts at 3.30. That's when my teams come in. Um, we get them set up. Most of the time I have them in Discord. I am in Discord with them recording their comms because communication is very important for us. This is the second program that I've started, so I'm building another one from the ground up. Uh, thankfully, my first program kind of prepared me for this. Uh, so well, I'm in Discord. I'm coaching them. I'm helping them. We will record their videos. Sometimes we'll stream them. Um, right now, we're trying to get some students to actually cast our videos for us to get them involved with that. Um, so sometimes we'll practice, other times we'll watch their replays so we can go back and show them like, hey, this is where you're messing up and things like that. That'll last until about 5.30 or 6. And then I go home and play more league with them <laughs> if they're online. Um, and then I work on my dissertation and then the day just starts all over again. Awesome. And so what would you say has been your favorite project that you've worked on? We can go backwards down the line. So if you want to start, Coach Ashley. Um, my favorite esports project right now, I guess, is just building the second program. Um, you know, season zero is, a, it was a learning curve <laughs> for everybody involved. And I really feel like my three years at my other school with that program kind of prepared me for this. Uh, now, the, the really big project that I'm trying to get the kids involved in is making a, a brand, like a social media brand for the new program and just getting them involved with like casting and recording and broadcasting and like graphical design for their teams. That's been a uh, really fun. That's awesome. And that's super important as well. Even if you don't have like the best like pros and players in your, in your school, definitely starting early with social media and casting is definitely something that, you know, we need in collegiate. So send them our way, please. <laughs> Dr. Moore, if you want to talk about, uh, your favorite esports project or any kind yeah. of project? My favorite esports project was my first esports project. Um, like I said, I didn't choose esports. Esports chose me. And people may gasp when they <laughs> hear me say this, but you know, before two years ago, I wasn't really hip to the game of 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 esports. Um, yes, I knew video games. I really didn't have a great understanding that this was, um, that esports was something that was professional, it was competitive, or that gaming was such a big deal. And I certainly know esports is not new. Gaming is not new. I just I understand that it's more mainstream now. Um, but my, I was voluntold by my hospital to be the team doctor for our Wizards District Gaming, our NBA 2K team. And I got on a call and they said, hey, can you jump on this call? I said, okay, sure. And there's all these people talking about this gaming, video gaming team. And I got off the call and I said, why was I on there? And they said, oh, you're going to be their doctor. And I said, what in the <laughs> heck do they need a doctor for? I mean, literally. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and two years ago, I, there wasn't a lot and there still isn't of information about what a gamer could need. What is their day-to-day -day like, especially a professional gamer? And so when someone gives me a task, I, I do it full out as 100% or I don't do it. And so 
Um, I'm thinking, what in the world am I gonna do with these gamers? And so I really did a very deep dive looking into research and literature and saying, what do they need? And so I was able to, with um, the help of some of our, our players, really understand what does a gamer need to be healthy, to be safe, to be able to play well. Um, and I put together a really great kind of comprehensive team of medical professionals to take care of our six gamers. And so just like I do for my NBA G League team or my WNBA team, our gamers had the exact same resources plus. So we had more people on our medical team than we actually had players. Um, and so that was my first project just to say, I think a gamer needs you know, a vision therapist, a hand therapist, a hand surgeon, an optometrist, a sports medicine doctor, a nutritionist, a sports psychologist, an exercise and performance. I didn't know where I was getting these things from. I just said, this is what I do for my traditional player. So I'm gonna also do it for my gamers. And we came up with a really comprehensive um, physical exam for gamers. And that's really where I dove into this space of health and wellness. And you know, for two years and fast forward, I'm the international thought leader on health and wellness floor for gamers. And two years ago, I didn't know deadly squat. So this is exactly what this conversation is about, these esport adjacent careers. I'm tried and true in traditional sports for a decade, but for esports, it's kind of, I'm the newbie, um, but I'm proud to say we've done a, a bang up job. So that is really my favorite project because that's what got me started. And I think that's helping to shape and change conversations globally. That is fantastic. And like, I haven't even thought about that. Like what a, what kind of, uh, you know, doctors a gamer needs, like obviously like you sit at the computer and you look at the screen all day and Wow, that that well, is now, fantastic. Sharon, now we can talk about it more, and that may be a career you choose. This is just like Ashley was saying. There's so many ways to get into esports. Wendy was saying you have attorneys and accountants. Esports medicine, it's new, but we're here. That is that's fantastic, and I would love to talk a lot more about you know health for gamers because I think that's super important. Wendy, if you'd like to talk about your favorite project that you worked on. Sure. Um, we are uh, really taking a look at the world and, you know, taking a look at underrepresented groups and our, you know, we have a goal of making gaming more accessible to women. Uh, and um, we all know that um, not everyone's going to go on to be, um, you know, an elite athlete. Um, that's less than, you know, esports is a sport like any other sport. And, you know, that's less than 1% of the population that will have that, you know, type of performance to put them on stage. Um, but, um, you know, there's many other, um, you know, dreams that can dream jobs that can come true for women uh, in gaming that we've been talking about. So in partnership with a thousand dreams fund, we put together and allied esports, um, we put together broadcast her academy. Uh, and that is um, a scholarship fund, um, but it's also so much more than that. Um, it does provide um, uh, access to uh, HyperX uh, um, women uh, for mentorship. And we also provide a, a live experience at our HyperX Esports Arena in Las Vegas. So we fly them on in, um, they get a production day uh, and they leave you know, with a, a new asset in their experience portfolio that they're able to take out into the job world. Um, we've also been able to um, you know, bring uh, broadcast talent because most of these gals aspired to either be in front of the camera or behind the camera. And we were able to take their talent. They're so talented. I mean, you would just not even believe that they're just like aspiring to be this um, because they're really good. Um, and we have woven them into a lot of our um, Twitch shows, our YouTube shows. So we've given them additional opportunities to be able to shine and to get that experience. Um, you know, we're really excited by this work. Um, you know, it's the impact that's needed in the industry. Um, and, uh, you know, it's in, it's in, it also builds awareness into another little pocket, if more than a little, it's a pocket um, of, of skills and in, in the industry. Um, I think that is very open uh, to women. And uh, yeah, so we've received a lot of good feedback about that. And um, I'm really proud that I was able to bring it to HyperX. We've never done anything like that. It's really our first scholarship fund um, and, uh, you know, more to come. Awesome. I've definitely kept up with the 1000 Dreams Fund and uh, Broadcaster Academy. I follow them all on Twitter and all right. it's awesome. <laughs> yes. um, 
so let's move on. We're going to start talking about some career challenges. Um, so, you know, were there any challenges you had early on in your career and how did you overcome them? What did you learn from them? Um, who wants to start us off? Wendy, do you want to start us off? Um, sure. Um, yeah, I would just, you know, way early. Well, I don't know if I should start with kind of like this chapter of esports career. Um, there was certainly, you know, industry knowledge that I needed to get having come from a pretty heavy um, kind of tech um, slash mar digital marketing background because I helped to form our internal digital uh, marketing agency. Um, so I had to learn a lot about the world of esports, exactly what the ecosystem consisted of. Um, you know, we sponsored so many teams, understanding just kind of all those performance aspects of it. So um, for me, that was, um, you know, getting that knowledge, I had to be a quick study, uh, a real quick study. Um, but I really enjoy that. I'm a learning person. Um, and uh, that just really spoke to me. So, you know, but it's pretty, it doesn't stop. I mean, there is, there are so many news threads every single day, you know, that was five years ago. And it hasn't stopped, I would say the, the kind of the velocity, the pace of the of the news is as um, as fast as it was, you know, five years ago, and maybe has even new dimensions to it just because of new brands coming on into the space. So um, you have to be resourceful, you have to be agile. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's. I think that's great advice. Yes. Dr. And, Moore? Oh, and I just want to add one other thing real quick. Okay. okay. I do think that um, I've been pretty fortunate to have, uh, you know, really diverse work environments from a very early start, um, e even pre esports. Um, so, you know, IBM was ahead of its time, quite frankly, um, it really embraced diversity at all levels of, you know, leadership and within, um, you know, their, their employee base. So got a lot of exposure to that and then moved on to HyperX and we're 70% female in marketing and 40% overall at the company. So a um, lot, of, lot of doors open there. That's awesome. Dr. Moore, do you want to talk about um, any challenges you face in your career? Yes, uh, that's an amazing statistic, um, Wendy. That that's a lot to be to be proud of. I, I want a job. I don't really have a skill, probably, but I'm I'm fine working from the bottom up. Uh, <laughs> Health and wellness. Yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, challenges for me. I am in a field, sports medicine, that is traditionally a white male dominated field, and so. As a black female physician, there are a lot of challenges that could have come my way. Um, I am, again, very blessed to have had this career, certainly a little bumps and bruises along the way, but I have had so many great mentors in my sports medicine career. Uh, and my very first mentor is a white male. Um, so they don't always have to look like you or, or be like you to be able to be that guiding light and to help show you. Um, you know, an Asian male, a black female, like these are my three main mentors in sports medicine. And so they have opened doors for me that I never thought I could walk through or ever dreamt of walking through. And so I think if I had not, it's not even think, I know if I had not had mentors to number one, guide me, um, to speak up for me, to, to say, yes, she's great, um, and give me the chance, not because of who, who I am or what I look like, but because of my work ethic and what I do. And so I have not come across a ton of challenges in sports medicine simply because um, I have had great mentors to, to pave my way and to sing my praises, and I bring the skill and the dedication to back that up. On the esports side, um, there are some challenges, and these are things I had no idea about. And like I said, I, I, I'm a newbie in this space, but when I was doing all this research two years ago and I found that you know, there's this racial divide in gaming. I'm thinking, how in the heck does that happen? You're just playing on a console or on a, on a computer. What, what is this about? Or this digital divide that I was reading about and especially this gender divide. I was shocked. And when I tell you I was shocked and, and Wendy, you've been in this game for a long time. So you have certainly seen these waves and ebbs and flows. But for me, those challenges, when I read about that, when I started hearing women's stories, that was infuriating. Um, it's infuriating so much that I started a nonprofit foundation 
uh, specifically for esports and STEM for people in rural America. Uh, my parents are from West Virginia, so my roots are planted deep in the soul of, of West Virginia, and I'm from Ohio for women and for underrepresented minorities, simply so they can have a chance that someone else gave me in this esports space. That also drove me to create a brand marketing and communications firm for women and people of color in gaming, to tell their story, to be able to give them global visibility and opportunity and equity, just like everyone else. And so those were challenges that I have learned about over the course of the past two years. Those are challenges that I have taken on personally um, and hopefully I know collectively as a group and as an industry, we're going to continue to move that. So we're not having this conversation five years from now about what are some of the challenges in esports. So that's, that's what I would say. Thank you so much. And I have also, I've been studying that divide between, you know, the gender divide in, in esports and is it, it can be, uh, infuriating for, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Um, Coach Ashley, if you want to talk about uh, any challenges you had early in your career and what you what you learned from them. Sure. Um, I just want to say, you know, it's still sad that we're having this conversation uh, after all of these years after Gamergate. I was a, I was big in the gaming community when Gamergate was going on uh, so that, you know, that was a little bit of a rough ride. <laughs> um, as far as challenges very early in my career, um, when esports was first announced everybody treated it like a joke <laughs> um they're like this has got to be a joke right um and then you know when some of us applied to be the coach you know again they treated it like a joke like it wasn't a serious thing like why are we giving people like this space just to play these video games because you know playing violent video games makes you violent right I mean that's <laughs> that's the notion down here in uh south conservative Georgia um, you know, it's not, it's not anything else. It's just video games. Of course, I'm being sarcastic uh, when I say that because I'm very passionate about it. Um, but, you know, it was a challenge to get it approved. Um, I felt like my interview with the board was more of a interrogation as, you know, why should we validate this medium? And my response to them was, well, you know, we have all these sports and, you know, some people can't play sports for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's a disability. Esports is very unique where we can be very inclusive and include all sorts of people that don't have a community. Like there's a huge community right now for these high school students to belong in gaming. A lot of my students from my previous program said, you know, I didn't feel like I was a part of the school until esports because then they were making all these friends. They were talking to people that they normally wouldn't talk to. Um, and then it was a challenge because I was a female head coach and I had to go to a lot of coaches meetings that were predominantly white male and, you know, get ragged on all the time. <laughs> so I didn't really enjoy going to those. Um, but what I did learn is the best way you can get revenge is to be successful. Be more successful than the people who are dogging you out. So what I did is I built a social media presence. We got the local newspaper involved. We were on the front page more than the football team, uh, which is saying a lot <laughs> for down here. Um, we received more cheers at the pep rallies and eventually we went further in our playoffs than they did. So, I mean, that's how I handled all of those challenges. I just made sure that we were always better. And eventually, once we started getting press, oh, people started taking us seriously. And all these local schools wanted to start having an esports program. Now, I will say with my new school, there hasn't been any blowback. Like, everybody has been very supportive. They're very excited to have it. Um, I have a really great co-coach. His name is James Dix. He kind of had the program a little bit before I stepped in. And this has been a very pleasant experience. But my recommendation is if you're facing a lot of blowback or challenges, you know, you just be successful and you show them. You show them how good you can be. And that that's what makes me uh, sleep at night. Yeah. That is, that's awesome advice. And even at a collegiate level, we have, we have trouble trying to convince the administration that esports is something to, you know, invest in and, you know, uh, foster a program here. So definitely feeling some of those challenges as well. Um, has there been 
any one piece of advice that really helped shape your career? I know, Dr. Moore, you talked about um, having all of these mentors. Was there any piece of advice that they told you that helped you um, kind of become the person you are today in your career? Yeah, so um, in speaking kind of to what Ashley was saying, be successful and, and it's about being resilient. And I think resiliency is, so there are studies that women are more resilient uh, than, than men. And there is something about that resiliency of everyone that helps us to overcome. But one thing that, um, first of all, I don't take no for an answer. If it's no, then it's maybe, let me pose a question in a different way um, to see if I can get a different response. But one thing that always has uh, stuck with me is you're gonna fall. We all fall, we all fail. Um, you learn from those experiences, they turn into successes. But if you fall, fall on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. And so that's one thing that was always told to me all the time. And so it's okay to fall, to fail, to stumble, as long as you pull yourself up and get right back on that horse and, and, and keep riding and keep living out your dream and your passion. So it's okay if it uh, doesn't work out, if it's a no, you answer it in a different way, you go about it in a different way and just don't give up. That's awesome advice. I will definitely keep that, <laughs> that one in mind. Uh, Wendy, do you have any advice that it helped you shape your career? Um, I had a lot of encouragement from female leaders. I wouldn't only call them mentors or whatever. They're just female leadership. Um, and they were very encouraging. And they really taught me that raising your hand and taking on more responsibility uh, is a good thing. And you know, do your best to over deliver. Um, and I think as certainly, you know, early in my career, I really felt like I had to, I had to work a lot harder and, and over deliver on that. Um, it was just the really kind of the times and stuff. And in general, as you raise your hand and you take on more responsibility, you start to, I guess you don't rely on one competency. So you start to flex a bit. Uh, and through that ability to flex, um, you position yourself for new opportunities. Uh, and you know you start to be cons in different considered circles um, that can open doors. And so you know with that agility and that kind of resourcefulness, it, if that shines through and you, you achieve that success, I think that was very helpful in kind of catapulting and, and shaping and creating pathways for me to make decisions on my career too. Awesome. I think that's great advice as well. Ashley, if you want to, do you have any uh, advice that helps shape your career? Yeah, similar. Um, similarly, let me get my words correct. <laughs> just, just don't give up. You know, as, as a gamer, as a female gamer, and if you've ever played any kind of online multiplayer game, um, it can be a nightmare for you as soon as you uh, unmute your mic and talk. It's even worse with uh, the kind of accent that I have. Um, so early on, I kind of built up uh, a, a resilience to a very toxic um, behavior. So, you know, just my advice would be just keep pushing. You, you know, you might fall down, you might fail, but, you know, it's very important that you get up and that if you're truly passionate about something, you will make it work. You will figure out a way uh, to make it work. And, you know, you should never accept no. You know, women have been told no all the time. And, you know, I know that these other two might be like me. We're sick of being told no or sick of being told that we can't do something. You know, my response to that is watch me. <laughs> watch me do this thing you told me I couldn't do. Um, so just keep pushing, be resilient, and never take no. Similar to, you know, I'm just feeding off of these other two very <laughs> successful women in this industry. <laughs> Well, because it's all good advice. And, and there's a poem that my dad would read to me all the time um, called Don't Quit by John Greeleaf Whittier. And everybody who's watching, Google the poem, Don't Quit. And that is something that I used to know it by memory. Probably if I told my parents, I didn't know it, I would probably get in trouble. Um, but uh, that that is just something that I also, I have it on a plaque. Um, I've written it inside a lot of my textbooks when I was studying. And so as you are getting in this career, 
having something you can look at as an affirmation, I think is always something good. So don't quit is a poem that uh, I have lived my life by. That is awesome. I'll definitely look it up like look enough, as soon as this is done. As soon as this is done. <laughs> um, do you guys have any tips on how to handle either difficult bosses or team managers or even teammates? Um, if who, if anyone wants to start, yeah. oh. I am being in medicine, especially sports medicine. Um, you're working as a team always. It's not just the physician. It's everyone that makes a patient's visit or experience successful, and that's from. Um, you know, custodial services to uh, the cafeteria, to the nurses, to the physician. And so when you talk about medicine and being um, on a team or a part of this esports or gaming community, it is about teamwork. Uh, you can't get anywhere in life, I think, without teamwork. Being this I, 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 I don't think gets you a lot of places, um, especially in this esports industry, as, as I am finding, it's a very small industry. Everyone knows everyone. Um, and so to say, hey, take guidance from someone because you don't know everything. You don't, you won't know everything, but being um, open to listening, being a team player, I think is really critical, not just playing with the team, but also um, being open to people and be kind. I really can't overemphasize, just be kind. My grandfather used to tell me, it doesn't cost you anything to be nice. Um, and so I don't know if that's really quite a tip. Well, no, that is a tip. Be kind, everyone. Um, but also I think when, we, when we're talking about esports and gaming, this old narrative is it's just a, you know, a boy in his parents' basement by themselves. You know, what we do know in this new narrative, and that's why we're having conversations like this, is to help continue to shift and push that narrative. That's no longer the case. You know, people who are gamers or in this esports industry, they are just as successful. Um, being a professional esports player is just as intensive stress-wise to your body as playing football or playing basketball. Um, it takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of strategy. It takes a lot of intelligence to really be at the top of your game. And so that, that we're kind of all just reclusive people who are gaming, that is also shifting. Um, and we know that all of this talking with social, that gaming is actually very interactive. Um, and that's kind of going back to Ashley was just was saying earlier in, at the top of the call. But when we talk about this mental health space and these negative narratives that are around gaming, we, we try and flip that and look at the positives and it shows great social connectedness and that you actually do have more ability to talk and connect with people. Although it might be virtual, but versus that versus being someone your own age in a public setting, you're much more conversive. So um, all those things are my tips. Those are some awesome tips and gaming is definitely social, definitely social. I'm not sitting alone in my bedroom playing video games all night <laughs> or anything like that. <laughs> um, Wendy, do you have any, any tips on how to handle difficult bosses, team managers, or even teammates? Well, um, certainly uh, at HyperX, we all are trying to be stewards of positive gaming, which means that you know, not only is that externally and what we, you know, uh, what we want our, our brand to stand for and how we participate in communities and stuff, um, but, you know, amongst one another too. So I think, you know, we need to, uh, you, I think you take some ownership of some of that, the, the difficulty and you inspect your biases, you expect, inspect, um, you know, are you carrying stereotypes? Um, you know, how are you, ex are you accepting of different points of view? You know, so pause a second and wonder about that, um, uh, I would say. And then, you know, check communication style. Um, you know, in the most kind of corporate sense, you know, there's a lot of training in terms of corporate uh, kind of uh, communication styles. And, you know, it does work. I mean, if you understand, you know, if you're working with an analytical type of person, you know, the type of information that you might share with them is, is, is queued up a little differently. That can, that can really take down a lot of barriers, you know, to the difficulty behind a conversation or something. Now, I mean, if it's going in an unwelcomed kind of direction and it's getting kind of a la that, you have to, you have to take other things in your hands and stuff, but, um, I just think that you might need to pause a little bit 
and wonder, you know, how you're weighing in on this. Um, because it's taken two to have the conversation um, and, uh, you know, see if you can redirect and come to some common ground. Definitely. And Ashley, do you have any tips for dealing with, you know, difficult bosses or team managers or even teammates? Um, it's very similar <laughs> to the other <laughs> advice. Um, I would just say, you know, always try to be respectful and be kind. You know, respect and kindness, uh, they do go a long way especially if somebody is coming at you from a place of hostility mm -hmm. or um, just, just being toxic in general. Um, but on that note, I will also say, you know, don't be a doormat. Don't let people just walk over you. Have your, your core values and beliefs that you're willing to stand up for, but do it in a respectful manner. And just, you know, be willing to look at yourself and think, you know, is it worth me staying in this environment if this environment is very toxic and bad? And, and I think that some people um, feel like they can't leave, that they're trapped. And, you know, you have to do what's best for you mentally and emotionally. And if you're in a very difficult position and you've tried being nice, you've tried being kind, you've tried everything that you know how to do, and you know that the problem is not you, it might be time to leave. So just, you know, stand up for yourself, know when it's time to leave and uh, be respectful and be kind. Definitely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about current career challenges. Um, on the topic of COVID, how has it impacted your day-to-day -day work? I know it, it has probably impacted each of you in a different way, um, but Wendy, if you, if you wanna start us off and tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so um, in, you know, being an endemic in, in gaming, we've had a huge demand on our supply chain, um, you know, whether it's, you know, core, core gamers gaming more, uh, dads coming back to game, you know, and, and pick up Halo again, um, whether it's, um, you know, or whether it's distance learning, I mean, and, you know, complete net new demand. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, strain in general in the industry to be able to supply that um, so that um, gaming is, you know, entertaining. Um, so for me in particular, though, um, there was canceled interest and collaboration. So things that we had had scheduled for um, kind of the spring as well as the summer because of the business uncertainty, um, you know, uh, at the outset of, of COVID. Um, you know, that resulted in cancellations. So partnership cancellations just couldn't go on. But then as COVID, as we got into the thick of COVID, actually, <laughs> kind of more, and then, and then kind of on the downslide, let's say more July, August, all of a sudden, there was kind of a, a pivot and a new norm and people understood their environments a little bit better. And then there was a net new interest, if you will. So um, because they started to understand, whoa, this is like compelling entertainment. This is a great way to reach, you know, um, uh, uh, consumers and stuff. So let's take a closer look at this. So things that had maybe been stalled now all of a sudden kind of put themselves in gear and said, no, 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 we, we you know, gaming is mainstream. We better hop on board. Um, so we saw a phenomenon that was both start, stop uh, in, in ours. Um, and uh, in general, I think that um, it all was a good thing for the industry, um, meaning that you know gaming has gone mainstream, um, and gaming uh, has provided a lot of good, you know, in a self isolation kind of world. So um, I'm not trying to shout that out because I know there's many industries that did not, you know, um, realize that type of um, uplift. Um, but still, uh, you know, gaming uh, has been able to fare pretty well. Definitely. Dr. Moore, do you want to speak a little bit about, uh, you know, in the middle of COVID, how, how have you, or how do you work with your, um, like, esports team? Because I know you talked about being in the uh, WNBA bubble, but what was it like working with your esports team? Uh, yes. So when... Our, our players come in what we call into market, meaning they come to Washington, D.C., where they're going to play. Um, and I saw them and did their physicals, their sports physicals, the first week of March. Um, I think it was the second week I was packing to go on the road with our NBA G League team because we had heard of this few positive cases, um, you know, across other sports. 
And then that night I was packing to leave was the night that the NBA shut down. Um, it was first positive cases for the NBA. So then that goes over and say, what does this do for our NBA 2K team? Typically, uh, you know, the NBA 2K season, they come in, in March and they usually kind of have their playoffs um, July, August, I believe. They were in market for such a long time. And I know people think, oh, well, gamers are just used to staying inside. They'll be fine. They just want to game all day anyway. But when you are in such um, a restrictive environment and here in D.C., you know, we were one of the places that was hit pretty hard. So to ask our guys, our players to stay in their apartment. So they live two together. So the two people in an apartment. Um, in the same building as your coach, if you can believe that. So it's like you have to see your teammate every day. You can't escape your coach. And at that point, everyone was saying, oh, well, it's just esports. It's virtual. Just go online. And it wasn't that simple. And trying, you know, talking about the lag and all these things. And so our players were, our esports players were just kind of at a standstill. We didn't, you know, it wasn't like we were doing a full, we, they weren't doing a full coaching session, going over strategy, you know, going, trying to limit their amount of practice hours. These are things that I help to or try to implement as far as healthy gaming. Everything was just in a disarray. Um, but what they did have as solace was gaming. And I think for the first few months before the 2K season actually started, they were doing okay. Um, and then there was a, a bye week or when everyone, and they're like, we just want to go home. And I had to make that difficult decision to say, you can't, because if you leave market, you can't come back. Um, just because we, you know, we, we're quarantining and all these things. And so it was a tough decision for me. Um, the mental health of our players is number one priority for me, um, as well as our coaching staff and, and everyone under monumental sports. And so that was hard and they were in market for a very long time. Um, you can game a lot, but adding on that restriction of not being able to go places. And then once we were able to kind of clear them to go into their studio, their practice facility, they don't want to go back. They had been winning at home in this setup of, you know, their apartment style setup. They were gaming with in their own apartments, even during the season. They weren't like in one big room. So they were each in their individual apartments. And that's just kind of what they got used to. They said, if it's broke, don't fix it. Um, although, you know, they got COVID tests and everything to get clear, but they chose to stay in their apartments. And so to me, this COVID time, like Wendy was saying, gaming took a big, you know, it was an explosion in some areas. For me to be to turn on ESPN, and watch my Wizards District gaming playing. I know. That, to me was, you know, I'm used to, yeah, watching our Wizards or our Mystics, but to see 2K, ES, it's eSports has, they saved, I think, um, our sports community. Uh, I think everyone, just to give us something that was light, something that was fun to watch, and it looked like sports. So, you know, when we're talking about our first person shooters, people can kind of get behind it more of the sports um, style of, of, of gaming because they they know it. And that was my first entree into it at the HyperX Arena in, in Vegas. And so that was just pure joy to see esports on mainstream sports, F1, I mean, all these things. So um, even golf. So, I mean, it was just, a, it, it was a crazy time, but I think esports took took notice and they were center court. And I think that is one of forever now change how people respect uh, esports and gaming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we do have one uh, Q&A question and Coach Ashley, uh, I'm sorry for, cut, for cutting you off for your question of uh, uh, your answer for, uh, you know, how things have shifted, but Let's answer this question. How do I encourage more girls to join our esports team when the scene when the scene seems so male dominated? Coach Ashley, if you want to start us off again, I'm so sorry that you couldn't sorry answer the question. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, I can be real quick. It's messed it up. <laughs> that, that's what it's done. Um, yeah, that is a, a really good question. And sadly, I have not figured the answer out to that yet. In my last program, when it was huge, we had 60 to 120 kids. I only had three female players. In my new program, where I have 25 players, I have one female. Um, so yeah, how do you get females uh, involved in esports? I think, um, you know, we still have a lot of sexist toxicity going on in esports. You know, Gamergate damaged the esports industry quite a bit. 
So, I mean, until we can shift that narrative, and I think things like this, using this panel where you can see successful females in the industry, um, you know, we, we've got to change the narrative. And I think that would first help draw in a lot of um, uh, females. And also you should talk about all the, the STEM programs that they should get involved in because they are so small, but I mean, they're growing, but it's still a very small number. And just talk to them about maybe the different opportunities that they have. I know that's what I've done in the past and with my one female player <laughs> we're really working really hard to get her to stay because she has experienced um some of that male toxicity in league of legends and i'm like well it's that's league of legends <laughs> um but you know it's not a reflection of the, the game developer or anything it's just it's the community that that you all feature in in chat you know it, it does a lot of work <laughs> definitely and dr moore wendy if you want to jump in on this one that'd be awesome I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think it takes people like us on this panel. It takes people who have a platform to be able to help change that narrative. My company and organization, we work with Ariel Powers, a WNBA world champion, who's also an avid, passionate gamer. She has a platform that I don't have and that you may not have, but she has one. She has a voice for the voiceless and we've created an entire empowerment campaign for specifically this, how to encourage more women to be bold, to be empowered, to be encouraged and educated and to engage in, in gaming. And so that's one thing um, that we are certainly working on. So I think it's gonna take gamers, activists, people who have a voice, Wendy, who is a, a veteran in, in this industry to use her knowledge, her platform to continue to push that. We both are on the Global Esports Federation, which also has an international platform in raising awareness for women in gaming. So there's a lot of things that I'm working on, but I think it takes people who have a bigger voice than me um, to help continue this shift. Definitely. And Wendy, do you have any, any thoughts on this one? Um, yeah, I mean, we continue to look for partnerships um, where we're going to make, where we see that they're making investments in, um, you know, increasing kind of a more inclusive environment. So when we go to, you know, a collegiate program, we ask them what their growth goal is to be able to encourage female participation. Um, and we need to hear it. We, you know, just something better than the last year is, is not a bad first step because you don't necessarily know what your number is, but at least, you know, we want to see, um, uh, you know, obviously a, an upward trend. And one of the reasons why we became, you know, an official headset partner of the NBA 2K League, my favorite league, is um, because, you know, they have a long history of, you know, women development and, and they literally had a women's development camp in the NBA 2K League, you know, one of the um, uh, drafts, um, uh, Chiquita, you know, made it, um, I think, second season. Um, and, you know, at least it is, they are, are, you know, keenly aware that there is work to be done there. That's all we could ask for at this point in time, that it's top of mind, and they're working towards change. Um, and, you know, we really kind of praise and, and recognize every ounce of impact that they can make, incremental impact, uh, and that's what we want to align with. That's positivity in gaming, um, you know, and that is producing a less toxic environment um, by making it more inclusive. Definitely. And I think that that's all that we have time for today. Thank you to all of our panelists for you so know, taking fun. the time to sit with us and, you know, talk about all of this. It's super important. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. We will be posting the recording on Play vs.com and we'll share the recap on socials for more information on the play versus game changer initiative you can visit playvs.com slash game changers in the meantime you can connect with us um, on at playvs on socials and thanks again and have thanks. a good day everybody <laughs> and the recording will be out in 24 to 48 hours i'm I'm hearing from the chat here. So everyone keep an eye on your emails. Um, yeah. thank and you. thank you again. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna end it. Thanks, bye. Bye. <laughs> See ya.